So, uh, thanks to Gati for inviting me as a contemporary jazz dancer. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> you know, it's so, so uncool to say that you're a lawyer. Uh, but what I will try to do in the course of this presentation is to maybe draw a few links between something as uncool as copyright and as uncool as law and, and, and dance. Uh, because in some ways we are accustomed to thinking about law as some kind of a regulatory mechanism that governs a set of practices. But the law is more than merely a descriptive system, it's also a constitutive one. Which is to say that in actually regulating something, it doesn't merely take something as, as a given, but produces it uh, as on, 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 the, on the basis of you know, its kind of cultural assumptions. So one of the questions that I'm interested in is, how does the law make sense of a phenomenon like choreography or dance? What are the ways in which it recycles assumptions that it has about you know, this object that it's seeking to regulate? Uh, but in that, in the process of, of such regulation, how does it, in other words, produce a theory of dance? And if you were to judge the law not merely by its own accord, which is to see whether it's a good or a bad legal theory, but if you were to judge it on the basis of dance, is it a good or a bad theory of dance? Let me begin with last year. Uh, this is a recent thing that happened. If my computer permits me to. So this is a film called ABCD, Anybody Can Dance. Translate 
into something like that of the choreographer or the performer. Are they necessarily the same things? Because in copyright law, it is presumed to be the same, right? You must remember that copyright does not have a separate category called choreography or dance. So there is instead, the definition of choreographic works is subsumed under the definition of dramatic works. And you look at why this becomes immensely significant. The second idea in copyright law is, of course, originality. But originality here doesn't refer to a literary sense of originality in terms of producing something new. It merely refers to a point of origin, where it can be shown that this was not copied. Now, how does this concept work when we think about dance? What does it mean to think about originality when it comes to something like dance? Third, fixation. Copyright, for you to be able to claim copyright, it needs to be fixed upon something. And this again becomes a crucial problem. Because what is fixation in dance? You can, of course, think about notation and, and various kind of notation systems, but this is rarely, rarely ever follows. The form in which dance is very often fixed is either in photography or in video, right? And this is an interesting conversation that we had earlier between Sadhanan and, and Preeti about is a performance the same when it is rendered across a medium? Are you really looking at a performance or are you also looking at a specific rendering of that in terms of through, you know, editing through jump cuts, that this is a, a, a new kind of thing that, that emerges. Fourth problem is the idea expression dichotomy. What is an idea expression dichotomy? In a popular sense, people assume that copyright protects ideas. Copyright doesn't. Copyright only protects unique expressions of ideas. What is an idea expression? Boy meets girl, they fall in love, is an idea which if protected would be the end of Bollywood as we know it. <laughs> Boy meets girl, they fall in love, they go to you know, you rail trip, girl comes to Punjab, boy comes following her to Punjab, and you have DDLG, a unique expression of the idea, boy means girl, they fall in love. But think about how you would think about the idea expression dichotomy when it comes to dance. The classical cliche that you hear about the dance, about dance, of course, is that you can't separate the dance from the dancer. Now, this indistinction, in a way, where the medium the body, the performer are all merged into one, does not allow for an easy separation between idea and expression. If you think about a popular dance form like the Macarena, what would an idea or an expression in Macarena be? Would performing it in a different rhythm constitute a new expression of the idea Macarena? Would doing it in the form of a Garba make it into a new expression of the idea Macarena? This becomes a very, very complicated terrain. And if you look at what this means when you look at legal cases, when you translate the terms of dance into the terms of copyright, one of the most interesting uh, cases in recent times <coughs> is the case of the Shivra, Shivram Karan case, where this is really about Yakshagana versus Yaksharanga. Now, what happened in this case was that the academy that he was a part of actually performed one of Shivram Karan's, you know, kind of uh, pieces, uh, and the person to whom Shivram Karan, in his will, had left all his the copyright of his literary works, filed a case of copyright infringement against the institute, right? Now this is a remarkable instance because what you really have here is the court trying to understand and to create in a way an author out of a tradition in which you classically did not have the idea of the singular author, right? So they argue that Yaksharanga hailed not just as a, as a reconstruction of a traditional folk form, but an active invention of one. And for the and the argument rested in a way on the scholarship that Karanth had done on, on the thing. And this is all, you know, the various kind of uh, quotations from his autobiography that they use as an example of how Karanth had actually invented a tradition. I'm not going to go into this in detail. Uh, the case is available. It goes to the Karnataka High Court on, 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 on the first appeal, goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court basically again upholds the contention of the Karnataka High Court showing that Karanth was an author, but they grant a specific exemption to the educational <laughs> institution. But look, let's look at the basis of the, the case. Karanth's authorial con uh, contention, I mean not him, but his, his, his heir, is that there is an improvisation in, in, the, in tradition of Yakshagana by short period. Right? This is all of these you know, extra paraphernalia, etc. Uh, it doesn't suit a modern form, so I need to merge it with the idea of ballet. And Karan's idea is that his specific contribution is to actually condense Yakshagana into a form that is recognizable as Bali. And there's been a lot of criticism of this by, by Rustam. 
in the case, Karant had basically willed to Malini Malia all the copyright in his literary works. Now, this is the first dilemma. What does a willing of literary work mean? Does it include a dramatic work? Because for them to claim copyright in choreography, you had to show that the dramatic work was also included in the will. In this case, the court basically equates the dramatic work with the literary work. To say that by bequeathing the literary work, Arendt has also bequeathed the dance. And if the High Court grants an injunction against the Academy, uh, preventing them from actually using the dance, right? So <clears throat> the legal issue was, is Karan's contribution an original contribution to Yakshagan? Is his contribution copyrightable? Was the performance of a literary work, you know, or was it of a literary work or a dramatic work? And what is the relationship between copyright and folk forms? You look at what the High Court says. The High Court says, what emerges from the above excerpts is that Karan did bring about the changes in all aspects of Yaksh Yakshagana by taking great pains and unearthing the lost ragas, identifying the songs which needed proper purity, etc., etc. In other words, it translates Karan into the kind of authorial figure which I highlighted is at the, at, at the base of copyright. There is no copyright possible without the resurrection of this figure of the romantic genius author, etc. But this creates then all kinds of ontological problems of thinking about what is the nature then of the work. You can institute an audio, but if the nature of the work, because of this tension between romanticism and modernism, is at the heart of it, how do you think about the idea of the work? In one of the most important cases on copyright law, this was a case between a film called Joy, and I'll just play you a very brief version of it. that the relationship 
between dance and copyright historically has always been a very, very problematic one. And for the longest time, if you move away from India uh, to the US, it's actually quite a remarkable story. There's a marvelous book by Caroline Picard, which actually does a history of how gender and race become the crucial components in the story of the claim to copyright by dance, right? Where it's essentially a history of the movement towards the creation of the white male auteur being able to appropriate forms of dance which were otherwise considered uncopyrightable and instituting in a way this idea of the romantic genius. So in, it, it's not until whiteness as property becomes embedded in law that you actually have the history of copyright making claims on dance as, as property. The first case that you have is actually in the turn of the century and this is Louis Fuller. Fuller was famously known as the inventor of the serpentine dance and the goddess of light. She was admired by Mallarmé, Yeats, toulouse lautrec Whistler, Pierre and Marie Curie, etc. She attempted to turn to the legal apparatus to seek an injunction, obviously because of her popularity, a number of people were attempting to do this kind of the serpentine dance. She wanted to get an injunction against a number of dancers who were copying her. When it went up to court, this is what the court says. The court says that Fuller was uh, <coughs> incapable of making a copyright claim because dance is unworthy of copyright protection because of its lack of narrative or dramatic content. And in his opinion, the court says, an examination of the description of the complainant's dance as filed for copyright shows the end sought for and accomplished was the illustrating and devising of a series of graceful movements combined with an attractive arrangement of draperies, lights and shadows telling no story, portraying no character, depicting no emotion. The mere mechanical movements by which effects are produced on stage are not subjects of copyright. Surely this dance described here conveyed and was devised to convey to the spectator no other idea than a comely woman illustrating the poetry of motion in a singularly graceful fashion. And while such an idea may be pleasing, it can hardly be called dramatic. Motion denied. <laughs> <laughs> Despite and probably because of her defeat in the realm of copyright, Louis Fuller actually ends up becoming one of the innovators in patent application for set design. So she ends up holding all kinds of patents on kind of set design and lighting, etc. Uh, because the copyright group was not available to her. But this is of course way back in the turn of the century. Things changed in 1976. But before I go to that, let me read out the ways in which Fuller managed to then establish herself as an authorial personality. And she says, there are 500 little missiles who can twirl a few yards of muslin and bob in and out of the focus of a limelight. But twirling a few yards of muslin and playing at touch with the limelight, any girl who is given to kicking her toes at all can do that. And they do not make a skirt dancer. To be an artist at your business calls for a life's experience. I leave nothing to chance. I drill my lightmen, drill them to throw the light. And so, they have to do their business with the exactitude of clockwork. Theme, style, time, all differ in one dancer from another. Again, what she's claiming here is both a combination of an absolutely embodied knowledge in terms of as a dancer, but also the disembodied elements that she is choreographing or curating. The next major case that you have is post-1976, and this is George Balanchine. Balanchine, of course, unlike Fuller or the dancers preceding him, uh, okay, I am running out of time, I have around two minutes, but to cut a long story short, uh, <coughs> Balanchine does not think that any of his ballets are worthy of any copyright protection. But his smart lawyer, because it's post-1976, post-1976, the change to the law is that it is no longer needed to have narrative for you to have copyright protection over a dance. So abstract dance becomes the subject matter of copyright. Balanchine's lawyer tells him that he can actually you know, copyright all of his ballets, and he does so. And he leaves them in his will uh, to his most trusted uh, compatriot, who then, when a book is released called The Nutcracker, which uses photographs of Balanchine's ballet, they are sued for copyright infringement. And this is a really remarkable story. Because in the first instance, the court says that this is not a violation of copyright. And the test that they rely on is reproducibility. And the argument is, can you reconstruct the dance looking at the photographs? If you can't do that, then it is not a matter of infringement. Right? So this is basically the reproducibility test. Losing that case, the Balanchine estate goes on to appeal. On appeal, the next court says the test that was applied is wrong. The test that should actually be applied is whether there is substantive similarity in the eyes of a beholder. 
In other words, a person looking at the photographs of the dance and looking at the dance itself, would they be led to believe that it is one and the same thing? And this is a really, really intriguing one because it actually collapses two different mediums. It is like asking, you know, the discussion that we had between the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional, in what manner may we consider them to be absolutely the same thing, right? Now, <coughs> applying, deploying this test, the court really opens up the space between dance and copyright and for the first time makes it copyrightable. I will take one minute to quickly narrate the rest of the story. <coughs> There are a whole range of interesting things that have happened subsequently. Uh, if you look, for example, at the relationship between dance and different forms of knowledge sharing, for example, in the open source movement, one of the early people to look at dance in terms of its components, uh, almost like algorithm, was Trisha Brown. Trisha Brown's accumulation and locus in the 70s was put down almost like it were an algorithmic instruction. So the question is, what happens when dance becomes no longer merely an embodied practice, but a disembodied one in terms of an instruction manual? Does it change the, the character of how dance can be seen to be protectable? Then you have Jerome Bell in his 1998 piece called The Last Performance, which is intended to be absolutely a quotation of dancers that preceded, you know, hit, preceded him. In this case, he managed to get permission from most, but was also denied permission by a number of dancers on the grounds that this was a violation of copyright. Then you finally have uh, <coughs> William Fawcett's improvisational technology as a tool for the analytical dance eye, which actually begins to make the claim that it's not merely the gesture, the movement, but also very fundamentally understanding them as building blocks and how they can be shared. So he produces a book and a DVD, which is kind of legendary, that ends up actually becoming the first open source dance project. And the project that I want to end with, uh, which I didn't realize, Shoyka Fai is actually performing tonight, which is my last example, is I'm going to play a small yes, segment of this. Find out what is the, the possibility of a type called Eternal Summer Storm? Yeah. Eternal Summer Storm is actually looking at uh, a Buto dance from Japan. So, Tasumi Hijikata was the founder of Buto dance, and he did the performance uh, Summer Storm in 1973 in Kyoto. So that was the last time he made a public performance that was filmed. So the idea was looking at how can we look at the documentation of movement, dance or culture in a different or alternative way. So what I did was I tried to uh, map movement, body movement from one person to another. I'll show you a video. Here is uh, basically I have a master sensor on my life, so I data. So I use Hichikata to stimulate this idea and uh, repeatedly keep myself moving by Hichikata. So by piecing uh, various part of this a summer song choreography and action of a summer. is obviously kind of transformed entirely, where the mimetic body, information systems, media technologies, all produce in a way a new mode of thinking about how bodies can even copy each other. In a way, opening up the terrain for a field which is really not meant to speak to each other, namely copyright and dance, but unfortunately because of the fact that they're forced to speak to each other, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we let it speak to us on the terms that it has set to that of the 18th century in terms of ideas of literary originality, idea expression, or do we attempt in a way to create from the imminent logic of our own practices as dancers and as choreographers, a logic which is not necessarily in a way about the idea of how dance may be considered as property, but really how do we create a system of propriety 
that allows us to borrow, beg, steal, even as we create some <coughs> method of acknowledging that as a part of the tradition that we constitute as our own. So this was merely a set of questions that I was supposed to open out in terms of a set of conceptual puzzles. In the workshop tomorrow, I will be taking on more practical, hands-on, single uh, questions uh, that some of you may have. Uh, but feel free to get in touch with me if uh, you aren't on that, you know, that workshop list tomorrow about specific queries that you may have on dance and copyright. Thank you.